Well, open your Bibles, if you would, to uh, the book of James, James chapter 5, verse 1. It's found on page 952 in the uh, chair Bibles that are in front of you. Again, this is James chapter 5, towards the back of the Bible. Um, We're continuing to work through our study called Proven uh, Through Faith, or Proven Faith, I should say, where James is calling on professing Christians to offer up the proof for the evidence that their faith is genuine and real, and really is calling us to examine ourselves. It's not as though there's a a show to be offered up. Um, The Lord Himself knows whether your faith is real or genuine. The question is, do you know? And it's really to bring it out, to examine it, to see what kind of faith you have. Because if you you don't have true and genuine faith, the, the consequences are eternal. So he is challenging us to look at our faith and to see if it is proven. Now, this section of Scripture that we are looking at this morning, we started on it last week, and we're going to, Lord willing, wrap it up uh, this morning. Here, James is calling readers to prove their faith in this segment by how they view the future, how we look for, how we plan the future, and what it is that we value. In other words, where are our treasures? What are we hanging on to? So as we as readers today need to consider the same questions and challenges that James is laying out for his original readers. That's the intent of looking at it, to evaluate our faith and see if it is true and genuine. At the end of chapter 4 is where this segment began, really, and and James started that section with the the phrase, come now. He was challenging those who who give no regard to the Lord's sovereignty over their life to, to reconsider. In other words, they are the ones that go around planning their days as though they're in control with no thought or understanding that there is a sovereign and eternal God who has control over all things. They make plans and say, I will go here and I will do this and I will do that as though they themselves are the sovereign, putting themselves in the seat of God. And James calls them out on it by saying, come now to get their attention. The true and genuine believer does the exact opposite of that. He understands that God is in control and understands that God is the one who orders the steps of a good man. There is humility in the person with genuine faith, a humility that recognizes God as the only sovereign, eternal, self-existent God. It is a humility that knows our life is like a vapor and our plans, when we plan them out with surety, are really the plans of fools. Rather, the one who truly has genuine faith seeks to do the will of the Lord. That is, he seeks to do what God says is right to do. And rather than just making plans and saying, God, this is what I'm going to do, get on board or get out of the way, he says, God, what is it that you would have me do? Help me to follow your path, your leading, and your direction. Now we come into chapter 5 and James issues a second come now. And and remember, these come nows that he uses are intended intended to get our attention. And they're intended to rebuke us. To to call us out of our stupor the way a coach grabs the attention of his team. It's kind of snapping his fingers and waking us up. So James is seeking to grab our attention and warn us about the deadly mistakes. It's almost like he's saying, hey, stop fooling around. This is serious stuff I'm talking about. It's dangerous stuff I'm talking about. See, what James is telling us is is dangerous because if your faith is not true and genuine, then you will not enter the kingdom of God on the last day. So it's dangerous if we don't pay attention. Because faith that is focused on the temporal is a deadly faith that will lead to the weeping and howling and misery. It's also a serious issue because we have been instructed by Jesus as to how to treat wealth and how to treat one another. Jesus has given us instructions in the Scripture as to how we're to handle temporal possessions. It's a serious matter. But sometimes we become so short-sighted that we can't see beyond today. We, we forget to look towards eternity and we, can only, we get so focused on, on the earth and the things of the earth. Sometimes we become so self-centered that we lose focus on what really matters. 
But you know what's worse than all of that, and than just a, a temporal loss or, or temporary loss of, of looking at eternity and getting focused? Because we do that, all of us do, and we need, to, we need James to come along and say, hey, come now, pay attention, what are you doing? But here's the real danger in all of this, idolatry. It's idolatry. We become idolaters worshiping the creation and not the creator. So as James would say, come now, pay attention. Let's see what he has to say. Let's look at our text and see how it relates to our view of wealth and possession. Stand with me if you're able for the reading of the word of God. And I'm going to read James chapter 5 verses 1 through 6 this morning. Come now, you rich. Weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Father, help us as we come to our passage this morning. It seems to be a biting and stinging rebuke that we are so quick to want to shift towards others. But Father, this morning we... May our guards be let down and the Spirit have free reign in our hearts to sow the Word of God, to convict us and to to change us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the real temptations when we come here to James's teaching in this segment is to quickly dismiss the passage as dealing with only those who we deem rich. In fact, if we're not careful... Every passage of Scripture we come to, we try to wiggle our way out of it and try to to shift it to those sitting next to us or those behind us or those around us. And somehow that we we must be the exception to the rule. This passage seems easy to do when we consider James is addressing the rich. And we have a varied understanding of what it is to be rich. In fact, the the whole of the world would have a varied understanding of what it is to be rich, and depending on what part of the world you live in would vary your understanding. Uh, Partly, though, because it always seems as though there's somebody richer than us. It amazes me that nobody considers themselves rich, whether I go to a third world country and I find there that people are, are not rich, or I come to a middle class country and I find that everybody here claims they are not rich, or whether I begin to sit with those who are in the upper class and they themselves also will, will see themselves as not being rich. As I said last week, we get to that point of saying, well, I'm not poor, but I'm not rich either. We want to fall below that, that standard. But as we noted last week, this title that James is using of being rich, I don't think applies strictly only to those who are wealthy. I don't think it applies only to those with a large bank account or lots of possessions. Now certainly you can can make an argument that he is talking about the rich because when you look at the verses that that are in the latter half of this passage, they begin to deal with paying laborers, and the, the implication is that this is a wealthy landowner who has property that needs to be mowed, and he has staff that will come and mow it. He has harvesters to, to bring in the crop for the winter. So he, he clearly is, is a wealthy landowner, and certainly back in the, the times of antiquity, there was a great gap between the common man and the wealthy man, and the land itself was really owned by just a few people. So you may look at this and say, see, James is talking to those elitist people who have much because they're not paying their laborers and they're, they're, not, they're withholding wages from them. But I think it would be a mistake for us to narrow the gap and limit it only to a small portion of, of the population. Rather, I think what James is doing is using this idea of what the rich are to illustrate a point that is closer to us than we want to admit. It's a point that becomes very uncomfortable. And remember, this letter of James is a very uncomfortable letter when you decide to sit down and meditate on it. 
because it's convicting. It strikes us at the heart. If you recall, when we were working through chapter 2, we noticed the contrast between the poor and the rich that that James lists out. He notes that those he, he notes those as poor in the world and says that they are also rich in faith. And from that we can understand that the opposite is also true, that those who are rich in the world are poor in faith. The key points in those phrases are in the world and in faith. See, these are the qualifiers that explain what it is to be rich and what it is to be poor. To be rich in the world is to be dependent on the world and the worldly system. It's to have a love and a trust in the world and all things temporal. To be rich in faith is to be dependent on God, and it is to have a trust and a love in God and to seek all things eternal. Love the world is focused on the temporal and in love with it. To be rich in faith is to be focused on the eternal and to be in love with God. Well, the framework of that is what is applicable here as well. The rich that are on display are an illustration, a magnification of what it is to be rich in the world. The point of James' rebuke are those who are rich in the world. So it takes us away from the amount of money in your bank account and it points us really to the heart of the issue. And that is a a heart that is in love with a bank account, whether it's the one you have or the one you want. This passage sings in harmony with the words of the Apostle Paul from 1 Timothy 6, verses 9 through 10. He says, Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Paul's words are true and they fall right in line with James. Paul is charging against the love of money. Now, this passage that Paul gives us is often misquoted, and people will say, money is the root of all all evil. Money is an amoral agent, meaning it's neither good nor is it evil. It just exists. It's a substance. It's a commodity. But it doesn't have any morality about it. Money is not the root of all evil. The love of money is the problem. Being wealthy is not a problem. Loving that wealth is the problem. Being poor is not a problem. But loving wealth is still a problem. And the love of money does not just lead to evil. It leads to all kinds of evil. And it's far greater than just the generic term of leading to evil. It leads to all varieties and all manner of evil. In other words, there is no pathway of evil that is off limits or out of reach to someone who is in love with money. It should also be noted that the love of money does not only extend to those who have money. The old bishop J.C. Ryle noted, it is possible to love money without having it, and it is possible to have it without loving it. It is possible to love money without having it, and it is possible to have it without loving it. Money is all moral. The problem is, are those who have a love affair with money, whether they possess it or not. Some spend their life collecting it and hoarding it and hanging on to it. Some spend their life chasing after it. Either way, they'll follow any evil path that it takes them down. This now begins to make our passage all the more uncomfortable because it removes the notion that James is simply rebuking an elitist group. But rather, what he is doing is he is rebuking those who are rich in the world, those who have a love affair with the world and the things thereof. See, the problem, again, that James is dealing with is a problem of idolatry. 
This is the real issue at hand. Loving money more than you love God. That's idolatry. We know that it's wrong from the teaching of Jesus in Matthew chapter 6 because he told us there you can't love both God and money. You're going to love one and hate the other, but you cannot love them both. We also know from the law given to Moses on the tablets of stone in Exodus chapter 20 that you shall have no other gods before me, said the Lord. Etched with his finger on a tablet of stone, it is the first commandment of the ten that he gave. In fact, not only is it the first that he gave, Jesus reminds us of the centrality of this command in saying that it is the first and the most important. When asked about it, what is the greatest of the commandments, Jesus responded in Matthew 22, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. What does it mean to love God with everything in you? It means that you have nothing before him. He is the object of your full affection. And anything that you love otherwise or anyone that you love otherwise is an expression of your love of him. So if you love your children, it's an expression and an overflow of the fact that you love him first. If you love your spouse, it's an expression and an overflow of the fact that you have love for him first. Love anything or anyone more than God is to be an idolater. This is what James is diving at. This is where he's, he's, he's pointing us. If you are rich in the world, your eyes are fixed there. You are an idolater. The first three verses of James chapter 5 expose the rich of the world as being this idolater, piling up treasures for the temporal days or the last days as he phrases it. And remember, the last days that James is talking about are the days we live in now because the last days began at the ascension of Christ and they'll continue until his return. These are the last days and what James is saying is you're collecting treasures for these days, for the here and now. And the collection and the love of earthly treasures is an ev evidence against them. In fact, it turns out to be a judgment on them of idolatry. Well, as we move forward in our passage, James introduces two more judgments that come. The words of judgment and the ways that bring judgment. Look now at verse 4 and we see the words of judgment. He says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. Notice it is by fraud here. In other words, this is theft that he's dealing with here. And what he is saying is that there are testimonies that speak against the one who loves the riches of the world. The wages themselves that should have been paid out to the laborers, they were denied their pay. It was withheld. And those wages themselves are crying out. This is seemingly the next progression of the evil heart. Not only loving the trinkets and storing them up for the here and now, but loving and desiring them so much that you will stoop to evil measures to acquire them. To steal, to defraud somebody by withholding their wages. Most laborers of the day were day laborers particularly the farm laborers, that's what they were. They had no contract, so they risked their, their livelihood to go out and work. They didn't have full-time jobs. They didn't have benefits. They were peace workers, day laborers. So when they went to work, they risked their health. They risked their livelihood simply to earn a few dollars to pay their bills and feed their families. No guarantees, no securities beyond the meager day, day's wage. And here what we find is that one who is rich in the world, who is loving the world, is so focused on his own material wealth that he is willing to deny what is owed another just to bolster his own collection. He would hire workers for the day and then fail to pay them or to keep back portions unjustly. You can almost hear an unjust employer in this fashion. Well, I, I know I agreed to that much, but the terms have changed now that the work is done. Or, I didn't think you worked maybe as hard as I thought. Or, I, I know I said that's what I wanted done, but I actually wanted more done, so I'm going to withhold. 
or I didn't say I would pay you today, I just said I would pay you at some point. All manner of excuse to come up with some reason to withhold the payment. I was thinking through this and trying to, to bring it into maybe a more modern understanding and uh, the, the more modern that I got to was the early 20th century and the late 19th century in dealing with the coal miners. And um, the coal miners of West Virginia and Pennsylvania, uh, many of them would work long hours underneath and, 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 and working hard to get to the end. And they would get to the end of the day and get their pay. And what they found was that they were not getting paid with actual dollars. They would get paid with company dollars. And part of their pay was withheld because they lived on company property and in company houses. And those company dollars that they were paid were only good at the company store. And when you go to the company store to buy your supplies for the day, what you found is that the price at the company store was twice as much as it was at the store down the street. But your company dollars only worked at the company store. And what they were finding is that they were working long and hard hours, and the more they worked, the longer they worked, the more in debt they became to the company that they worked for. Because at the end of the day, they didn't have enough money to feed their family, so they went into the company store with what they had and said, I don't have enough, and so they signed a promissory note. You can hold back more of my wages. It was a scheme by the coal mining owners to indenture their workers really to keep back what was owed. This is not consistent with one who is in Christ, with one who has genuine life-changing faith. This is not consistent with one who is laying their treasures up in heaven and serving Jesus as master. This is rather consistent with one who loves money. And at the end of the day, both voices are testifying of the corrupt heart here. Both of them are words screaming out of judgment. The voice of the wages and the voice of the laborer themselves are coming out. James personifies wages by describing them as crying out against you. The wording is that of one who is shouting. And the point is that you cannot hide the wages that you withheld. There's no way to hide it. It's in the bank account, it's owed to him, and it's sitting there. And it just screams out again and again. Now, if you've seared your conscience, maybe you just love it so much it doesn't matter. It's reminded of that old Edgar Allan Poe short story there, The Telltale Heart. It's a gruesome story, I don't necessarily advise it, but the point is that uh, <laughs> he heard the beating of the heart of his crime even when no one else heard it, it was there testifying against him. So too, the money that you've withheld testifies against you. It screams out. It cries out with a loud voice. It is shouting the judgment against you. And then the last day, it will take the stand. Personified, crying out, thief, thief. You have stolen by withholding what is not yours. And in like manner, not only will the, the substance themselves cry out, but the voices of the laborers cry out also and testify. They cry foul. I worked and was not paid. This is no small offense. And James, of course, writing to predominantly Hebrew Christians, knows that they would be deeply aware of the, of the guidelines of Scripture. Leviticus 19.13 says, You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. Not only are you not to withhold the wages, but you are not to delay in paying them out either. And the glaring point is that withholding them is equated to robbery. So both the wages and the laborers are now crying out against you. You know, God loves the poor. And in fact, in His whole system that He set up with, with, his, with his people, with the Jewish people throughout the Old Testament, was to care for them. Even in their farming, they were to leave some behind for the poor people to come and to glean so that they would have. They're instructed to be generous and kind. Not to deal ruthlessly with one another. 
Here the wages are crying out. The laborers are crying out against you. This is indeed sin, and the Lord will hear of it. Deuteronomy 24, 14, and 15 says, You shall not oppress the hired worker who is poor and needy, whether he is one of your brothers or a sojourner who, who are in your land or within your towns. You shall, not give him, or you shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor and counts on it, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. Here's the great warning. The sin does not go unnoticed. The voices that cry out do not fall on deaf ears. They fall on the ear of the Lord. And in the passage of Deuteronomy, it is Jehovah, the very name of God, the great I Am, the eternal self-existent God who is outside of all creation. That's who hears the cries. In our passage in James, he says it's the Lord of hosts or the Lord of Sabaoth in some of your translations. And maybe you're looking at that and saying, well, what is Sabaoth? Well, it's the Lord of hosts. And that didn't give you any clarity either. So you're saying, well, what, are the, what is the Lord of hosts? Well, what this is, is it's a, a descriptive title talking about the commander of an army, but not just any army, the army of the hosts, the army of, the, of heaven. It is a, a mighty military term that points to the most powerful of all armies, the army of the Lord, the angelic army of God. The army that obeys His voice and does His bidding. And you cannot stand against the Lord of hosts. It is intended to be a powerful title that James is laying out. You want to be careful here because this is who hears their cries the commander-in-chief, the Lord of hosts. It's not wielded lightly. And the point is to cause us to gasp. It's no small thing that you may withhold something from someone that you owe, no matter how minimal it, it may seem to you. The cries of what you withhold and the cries of the one who has been defrauded reach the ears of the Lord of hosts the great commander, and he will unleash judgment upon those who steal. He will act. No matter how hard you try to cover your tracks, they will be exposed. Well, let's take the illustration just a little bit further because, again, we might sit back and say, well, I, I don't have any employees. I don't have to pay anybody. Well, let's take it a little bit deeper here because we can't get away from this, make it a little more uncomfortable. This is also applicable to how we uh, treat an unjust return. Because it's really about the heart here and how we view things. But an unjust return might be in the fact that you paid money to the cashier and they return to you more money than is owed. You ever had that where they seem to mess up the change and can't get it right and give you too much money back? Or maybe the bills stuck together? It doesn't seem to be quite as common today as it once was, but I have seen it where they handed back more money than you paid them. And you can walk out the door not only with the product for free now, but also with more cash than you came in. And as a child, I remember being with a, with a family member who, who saw that and quickly stuck it in the pocket and was boasting as we went out what a great deal this was. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. That must be how you do it. No. May that money burn a hole in your wallet and scorch your leg in the process. What about a bank error that credits you too much money? That seems to be becoming more popular or happening more often. At least it does in my life. We keep putting checks in the bank electronically with a picture and somehow the camera and the process gets it all wrong and then we got to call them up and say, hey, you put too much money in. Because if they put too much money in my account, it means they took too much money out of somebody else's account, and they got to get it right. Maybe a little more personal, how about the stroke of a pen when you're filling out your taxes? Just move the, move the decimal point or skip adding this amount in or that amount. You know, you can do a little tweaking on it, and all of a sudden your return may go from a small one to a large one. 
Or maybe you're not in the process of getting returned, so you can go from owing a large number to owing a small number. Just change the answer. I mean, we can justify that one in our minds, right? I mean, this is a corrupt government that takes our money and uses it for awful things. I pay so much in any ways, they must just owe it to me. We can stroke the pen. They probably stole it from me or from someone else after all, right? The, the problem is that this is all theft. It's all stealing, and it's a revealer of our hearts. And you can, ex- you can take it from there and apply it however it does and whatever temptation is in your heart for it, because I know you have it, and you can address it and deal with it. Understand this. When you're tempted to do something you know is wrong in this capacity, it's a temptation of idolatry. It's a temptation to love money, and that is the root of all kinds of evil. It exposes the love of the world. This is what James is driving at. This kind of conduct is stealing, and this theft reveals the evil of our heart. We love the world more than we love God. This brings us to the final judgment brought up by James. Your ways will judge you. Look at verse 5. He says, you have lived on the earth in luxury in luxury and and self-indulgent. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. I hope I emphasized that enough that you caught that there are three you haves in here, right? Three you haves. James is giving three specific ways that the actions of the lover of money serve as a judgment against them. In fact, these three ways build on each other, or, or perhaps they're, they're steps, downward steps that lead into the pit of death, you might say, almost like a, a spiral going down. Way number one is selfish indulgence. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. Understand this again. He is not condemning having nice things. He's not condemning having wealth. He's not condemning you enjoying what God has given to you. If God has blessed you with things, enjoy them to the glory of God. I had a conversation with a young lady one time who was blessed with a, a new vehicle, and she just f- felt guilty about it because it just it, it seemed too much for her. And I said, did God give that to you? Did, did you have the finances to purchase it? Is it a blessing? Well, it is. Then enjoy it. Enjoy it because God has given to you and enjoy it for His glory. So if God gives you and blesses you with things, enjoy them to His glory. That's not the problem here. The condemnation that's coming on is a heart that loves those things and ruthlessly moves about to acquire them and more at any cost. The goal of acquiring them is to live in luxury and self-indulgence. That is, wanton pleasure. Riotous and wasteful living. This is the one who gives himself over to the pursuit of pleasure, striving to satisfy the desires of his longings without restraint towards pleasure. It leads to vice and it leads to evil endeavor. It's the wasteful living of the prodigal son. Remember the parable of our Lord? He spoke of the son who demanded his inheritance and then ran off into a distant land and wasted it on evil pleasures. This is what James is talking about. This kind of extravagant living that seeks only to satisfy the flesh and has no concern for those who are in need. It is the wealthy living luxuriously while the poor are starving. It is almost like pouring salt on the wound. There are those who are struggling to make ends meet. And instead of helping, you flaunt it in front of them. Lest you think this is something that falls only outside of the church, we should probably consider the church at Corinth. Paul warned them that they were abusing the Lord's table because they were coming hungry while others were bringing meals and eating to excess. And it created this whole mess that was going on because instead of coming together in unity and sharing the bounty of the Lord with one another, some were coming and being gluttons in front of those who were starving. Paul warned in 1 Corinthians 11, he says, When you come together, it is not the Lord's supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? 
Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I com- commend you in this? No, I will not. Now, Paul isn't saying we shouldn't have church gatherings, okay? Yes, we definitely should have church gatherings and fellowship. His point is, if you're just going to come there and, and eat a bountiful feast and, 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 and gluttonous style while others are sitting around starving with nothing, don't do this. It's evil. Rather, what you should do is come together and share and commune and fellowship and give and be generous. There is no room for self-indulgence in the church of God. Well, this leads to the second way that brings judgment, and that's gluttony. It, as I said, they build on each other or they move a step further down the spiral. He says, you have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. This is the, the natural effect of self-indulgence, a fattened heart. It's like fattening the calf for the slaughter. The beef farmer understands it. As the, the bovine is getting closer to the point of, of, of sending him off, he spends the last few weeks and days fattening him up. He brings him into the final pasture to finish him off, feeding him with the high grains, the high fat foods, so that when he is slaughtered, the beef is tasty and satisfying, and it will bring the greatest of prices. So in the final days, the creature is given the best of the foods and nothing is withheld. It seems to the animal that life is great. He has no idea his end is near. The illustration is a graphic picture of what is to come for the selfish heart that loves the world. Because while you glutton on the pleasures of the earth and the the things of heaven begin to grow strangely dim, you are eating and drinking judgment upon yourself. You're tasting the bounty of the Lord, but you do not acknowledge Him. Rather, you bow to the idol of pleasure and your heart grows fat. And in the last day, this will be judgment against you, and it will be the day of death. That's why it's, that's why it's graphically described as the day of slaughter. As striking as these two judgments are, the third is the most condemning. Way number three is murder. He says in verse 6, you have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. This is the striking blow, the final step in the downward spiral of eternal death. In the day of James' writing, many of the day laborers depended on the wages of the day to pay for food and housing. If they were not paid for that day, then they did not eat that day. Some of the corrupt business owners were not only withholding the wages, but they were taking the poor to court and oppressing them, forcing them into servitude or slavery, much like we described of the coal miner situation. They would use the the legal system, so they would withhold their pay so that they could not pay for their housing or other debts, and then because they, they couldn't pay for their other debts, then they were brought into court because they didn't pay their debts. With the scheme in hand, they had corrupt judges as well, and the laborers were no longer hired hands, but they would become slaves. And herein you have the death of the laborer. Perhaps it's literal death because sometimes it may not have taken them in as slaves, but the fact that they withheld finances could lead to starvation. Either way, the point that James is making is that the poor have been condemned and the rich are at fault. It is an unjust condemnation that will lead to a just condemnation. For the Lord of hosts hears the cries and he will bring justice. I think the last phrase is a telling phrase, and it points the reader to Christ. He says in verse 6, You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. The righteous person is Christ. He's the ultimate righteous person. And he was unjustly condemned and led to the cross, and he did not resist. This will be the testimony of judgment. Every good man that is put down and taken advantage of will serve as testimony against the oppressor. 
especially when, the follow, when he follows the example of Christ and does not resist. It is an interesting passage. The order of it seems to be reversed almost here because James starts chapter 5 with this rebuke and in it he tells us what it is that we are to do. He gives us the application at the beginning and then he explains why in the following verses. Most of the time you get the problem and the reason of it and then at the end you get the application. So before we close, I think we have to turn our eyes back to the opening words of this chapter because herein lies the help. If we find ourselves uncomfortable in how we treat money and possessions, we find ourselves convicted by our love of money, then we need to look to the rebuke for the help. And if you look back to verse 1 of chapter 5, he says, Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. When we started this, I said, here's the warning. It's a call to repent, a call to confess, a call to grieve the sin of idolatry. To see the judgment that you deserve and to turn to Jesus. For some, it's, the, it's going to be the first time that you turn to Jesus. <laughs> the Spirit of God is going to convict you. He's going to blow like a wind, as, as the Gospel of John tells us, as Jesus says. And He's going to do miraculous things in your heart. Your eyes are going to be opened and you're going to see your sin and your love of money over God and love of things over God and you're going to be broken and repent, and I pray that you find Christ to be the Savior and the treasure that truly satisfies. For many of us here in the church, this will be a return, an uncomfortable surgery in which we have to evaluate how we handle wealth. Are we hoarding it or are we using it? There is a great deal of good that can be done with the wealth that God gives us, so are we using it for the sake of the gospel or are we using it for wanton pleasure? And I don't have an outline that can say if you spend this much on this or this much on that or you put it here or you give it here that you're doing right or you're doing wrong. This is, this is between you and the Lord. This is your heart exposed before Him. Because again, it's not about what you have. It's not about what you give. It's about what you love that matters. Are we seeking the pleasures of this life or are we laying treasures up for the next? Are we blessing others or are we fattening our hearts? Solomon listed all the pleasures that money and power could buy in Ecclesiastes chapter 2 and then he said he withheld none of them from himself. He pursued every pleasure that was out there. And after he said that, in verse 11 of chapter 2, he said, Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had extended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Friend, if that's where your heart is and that's what you chase, understand that is the end of it. Chasing after wind. You'll find that it's vanity, and if there is no repentance, then it will testify in the last day as judgment against you. Wanton living gains nothing. Paul's instruction to Timothy at the end of his first letter in chapter 6 again, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. God gives us everything to enjoy, so set your heart not on the things, but set your heart on God who gives them. They are to do good to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what is truly life. Here's what Paul is saying. Listen, thank God for what He has given you. Enjoy it to His glory. Use it for His glory. Bless others. Store up treasures in heaven in the future. And then you'll grab a hold of what is truly life. In other words, grip life and Christ tight and hold the pleasures and treasures of the earth with a loose hand. Give generously and treasure the eternal. So how do we view the future? 
it tells us a lot about our faith. Who do we trust in? What do we love and who do we treasure? Proven faith looks to the eternal and not the temporal. Father, we thank you for this morning and for your word. It's uncomfortable to read. May your spirit sow the conviction deep in our heart and change us as a result of it today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.